What is up, folks? Justin Connor here. Hopefully you can see the background if you're watching this on video that the set in the studio here at the new place is slowly, slowly starting to take shape. I've had a lot of uh, work that I've had to do to get this space in working order, but that's not why you're here. You're here because I'm talking to Matt Rolf today, who is a renowned leadership coach and hospitality expert. In his new best-selling book, You Can't Do It Alone, Matt shows you how to make employee development central to your business growth planning through culture, unity, and leading with true authenticity. You can probably see why I was excited to talk to Matt. I thought we had a really, really good conversation. And I really try to push Matt in this conversation to give some practical advice for first time leaders and people who are struggling to delegate or to trust their employees with important aspects of the business that you might take very, very personally. Matt's work, including his new book, is linked down low in the description. If you want to check that out, I'm going to get out of the way. Enjoy the conversation. This episode of the show is sponsored by a new app called Wisdom. If you like having me and my guest share expertise and stories on the show, you'll probably dig Wisdom. It's an audio-focused app that's bringing top mentors across a ton of different industries straight to your ears. And I'm excited to give it a shot. I'm going to give it a try. I'm going to hop on the platform and see where it goes. So on Wednesday, December 29th, 2021, if you're listening to this, you may have missed it, but I might host things there in the future. I'm going to be hosting a session, and I'd love to have some of you folks there. I'll be framing the space where I'm speaking specifically around my 2022 playbook. Those of you who don't know, it ends up being a solo podcast every year. I turn it into an article. I share all the things that I'm thinking about heading into the new year, which is kind of like a year-end review as well. And I'll be writing it at that time, so you'll kind of get a chance to see what I'm thinking about as I'm writing it. And then from there, I'll be inviting some of you folks up to ask some questions. I'll talk one-on-one with you. And for those of you that have been asking to share your stories on the podcast, this is a great chance to do it. So download Wisdom, give me a follow through the link in the description, and set your calendars for December 29th at noon Pacific, and I hope to see you folks there. Matt Rolf. Thank you so, so much for coming on the show. It's really, really great to have you. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. As kind of a fun way to get a sense of your background, I think we all want the things that you outline in your book. We want motivated team members. We want leaders that have a clear vision. We want, you know, a positive and uplifting work environment. But I find with most people who champion all of those things, it either comes from a place of seeing it once and they're like, that's, this is the way, very like Mandalorian style, or they have this horrendously bad opposite end of the spectrum experience and they're like there has to be a better way so i'm curious yeah. if you fall into either of those two camps uh for myself personally yeah yeah, yeah myself personally would be the, the latter i i do believe just as you said that as humans we either move away from pain or we move towards pleasure um as an entrepreneur myself for the last 15 years um i really moved away from pain i was the the bottleneck in our results hospitality company with the best of intentions. You know, I was working 70 hours a week. I was driving my team harder than we could sustain. Um, I thought that pushing aggressively and pushing extremely stretch, high stretch goals was what everybody needed and wanted. And I was burning my employees out, my friends out. Um, and it really hit me, the pain hit. I walked into a meeting one day or a team meeting and I was, I was late at another meeting and my partner was running it. There's 18 people in the meeting and I look at them and I could see the dark in their eyes. I could see the body language down and I, and I stopped and I said, what, what's happening? It's mid summer for that company. And this is going back a good chunk of years. Um, and I walked into that meeting with tears in my eyes, realizing that I asked for more hours, more time and more work than I was compensating my people for. And I walked, we had a meeting the next day and I said, I didn't see it. I do now. And my commitment is to work together as a team where I don't do it again. So, um, I lost great friends and great employees. We lost clients. Um, and it was a hard lesson that a lot of us learn way too late. Are there any, like when you, I mean, that's so hard, right? Like that to, to have a team that count, looks to you as that, as that leadership yeah. force and, and to have to have that hard conversation, were there things that you sought out or, or things that you found helpful to have that conversation? Cause I, I think that there are probably people listening who have managers or they are the manager where they look, they go into the locker room and they see that exact scene that you're talking about, yeah. but they just don't feel like they have the tools in the tool belt to address it. So, so, so did you seek out anything or, or looking back at what you know now, what, what would you advise someone to do? Who's feeling that? Um, I think that there is a feeling, right? So I think the feeling isn't for most of the people I get a chance to work with. It's not that they're underperforming. I get a chance to work with top performing restaurants and restaurant groups and leaders and leadership teams, but the feeling of where my phone rings from people who know me or don't is it just seems harder than it should be. 
you know, I'm working harder than it should be. The senior leader is saying they have to make more decisions than they feel they should want to. Or the, the general manager is calling to be like, I can't make any decisions. The owner has to make them on their own. So it's, it's really is that point of things are just harder than they should be. And, and for me, when I started to reach out was there has to be a, a better way. So about a decade ago, 12 years ago, I had someone come into my life who said, you know, you've got to, you've got to focus more on your personal development. It needs to be a bigger commitment. You have the effort and the drive, but you're going to run straight through a brick wall. Um, so I've, I've got a commitment uh, where I spend up to a quarter of my year, depending on the year in personal development. Uh, but where it started was in a Tony Robbins conference. Um, yep. I'm a big fan of Tony's and it was a dream of mine to sit in a conference of his. And the one thing that he said, and Gary V backs this up probably more for the audience now, but says you can't expect your team to put in the same hours and effort that you are as the owner. Um, and Gary V's got a great video on YouTube. He's like, it's absolutely ridiculous for you to think of that. And that was my expectation that as the owner of the business, I expected the same return on time, return on investment from everybody around me. Um, and when I went out into the thought leadership space and to pay for coaching myself, if I looked at the pattern, no matter who the coach, you know, it could be Brene Brown, Eric Thomas, or Tony Robbins, if you want to look them up online, completely different coaches, but with the same uh, theory, the same philosophy around what you could expect from yourself and your people. So uh, I'm a big, I'm, I'm, I invest a ton of, of my personal time in my own development, and I'll continue to do that ongoing. I'm curious, I mean, to get, you know, go from macro to a little bit more uh, tactical, have you, and this is something I was literally thinking about this this morning, because yeah. I had a friend who was messaging me on Twitter about different types of business models in the kind of restaurant space as a, as a chef. And he's more on the private chef side of things. But sure. I, I was asking myself, like, is there a model that works that you've seen well, where employees stand to have a little bit more of an ownership structure? Or does that become this thing because hospitality workers like flexibility and travel and they move from job to job as kind of part of their lifestyle where, okay, this is frustrating because we constantly have equity moving around because it's like people are leaving and coming and going. Yep. Like, is there um, an incentive structure that you can get the buy-in and you can have that kind of like the employees have skin in the game. Maybe it's profit sharing. Maybe it's something different sure. that you've seen that works so that you can have a little bit of that other side of the coin that you're talking about. Because, yes, you are the owner, but you also a lot of people who are listening want their teams to feel invested in the outcome and the day to day and all that stuff. Yeah, I, I, great question. And we could get really into the granular side of that. But I think if anybody's looking uh, to that, I'd be happy to, to supply some more information. But at the top line is it's the assumption sometimes of senior leaders that they want to have ownership in a restaurant. And if we look at what we just went through through COVID, most restaurant owners have invested tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars of their personal money and time and risk to get their businesses through something with an unclear future. You know, Q1 of next year's, I think it's going to be the most challenging time of the pandemic for our industry in respect to closures. And I say that respectfully um, because I feel we have a big cash flow concern coming no matter where you are in North America or potentially around the world. So I think it's an understanding of two things. What does ownership really mean? And I think that can work on a smaller scale, kind of one to three venues, um, but it really needs to be discussed. Um, I got offered ownership in my first entrepreneurial venture and I didn't understand it. Um, and if they're turning some pretty, for me, animated conversations to be like, Hey, you're driving a Porsche and I'm driving a Ford probe and we're partners and what's going on. And my partner at the time just laughed and said, Hey, I got 20 years on you. Let me explain how, how this game worked and where, where the money comes from. Um, but I think profitability is one side. Profit sharing is another. Um, but an owner needs to be prepared to define profit. I've sat with dozens of ownership teams and this isn't managers and, and owners, but owners of multi-site restaurant groups, of you know, 10 million, 20 million, $30 million plus operations that all had a different definition of how their business was calculating profit. So who's operating, who's a silent partner, who's got their car involved, who's taking a draw, who's taking a salary. So I think profit sharing is great, but you have to clearly define it. Um, what we're seeing that I think is most successful and I, there's no confidentiality here, people know it, but I had a chance to work with the Joey restaurant group uh, based out of here in Canada, they've got a bunch of venues opening in the U.S. and they had an employee. Have some share. here. Sorry? In Seattle. Yeah, yeah they have Seattle. two of them. I think sure. in Seattle, yeah. Joey and Local, they have one of the best committed teams I've ever worked with. They're one of the best run operations um, 
you know, door, front door to back door, head office to entry level position. And they do have an employee share program uh, at a certain level of the organization. So people aspire to be part of the employee share owner program. And the people that have been there, my first workshop with them was brought in to do an hour talk. They had, I think it was 18 employees or 23 employees had 400 years experience with the organization. And most of the people are in their 30s. I'm older than them. I'm going, hey, what's going on here? Like, how is that possible? Why are you all staying? And it was the employee share ownership program that was really helping them uh, get the retention of their senior leaders. I'm curious how they structure that. Is it is it something where they it's a tenure based thing? It's a it's a role like you have to get promoted to a certain you know level in the hierarchy to, to get access to that because, you know, it sounds attractive, but like. I'm so uh, there's this great quote that is like incentives rule everything around me, which is kind of like a, a riff on the kind of like rap lyric. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm so curious how they do that. And I think, well, there would, and that's where they, they do have signed NDAs and stuff for, for me to share. But oh, I think sure. At, I see. Got um, it. Got I think it. you can look and there's lots of people that are doing it through the pandemic. We saw a bunch of companies out of the U.S. go the same route and it went public, even like Chipotle's own um, with their managers and Chick-fil-A with their managers. Some of it's tenure, some of it's position. I see. A lot of it's like what I'm hearing is once people work up through the organization, so you're not hired in, but work up certain positions to the GM position, that's where some of these benefits really start to take place. But I think what you have to define is what's the path to leadership? So one thing we work with our clients on is if you start as a server or you start as a host, you know exactly the steps that you need to take to have a path to leadership, how you progress through the organization, and then where the financial benefits are. Because I don't think financial is the only motivator, and I think for the next 12 months, uh, security, safety, communication, and trust uh, will be as important to the core of a management team as money will be. And I think there's a big fight for people to disagree with me on that. But I think people need to trust our industry again. Um, but the, at, I think if you're looking to get into a management position is if I'm going to run a $3 million restaurant or a $10 million restaurant, how do I, you know, how do I benefit as it wins itself? You touched on something and I want to circle back on it because I think it's really important that people who are first getting their toes into business ownership, being part of an opening team, there's like this big thing that's happening in Silicon Valley right now with software engineers where People are lowballing their salary and offering equity as upside to kind of bridge the gap because maybe they haven't gotten funding yet or whatever. And a lot of restaurants don't always get funding. Sometimes they are bootstrapped in some sort of way or they're starting with a pop-up and then they're going to kind of scale up. Yeah. What should people – and you mentioned it a little bit, but I want, to, I want to pull on that thread more. What should people keep in mind if they're offered equity in a business kind of relationship where they're getting hired or they got recruited and it's like, hey, there's equity on the table. I think everybody thinks that that means – it's good and it's always the same thing, but I've been in situations where it's not. So, so give some people some advice that they can use. Yeah, especially, and I know we said if it's front of house or back of house here, and we see probably even more so now I'm seeing back of house um, team members being offered equity first, but I think it's, it's looking at the fine print and making sure there's a clear definition of what the equity means. Um, what's the ability to sell your percentage of the business? Who's going to value the percentage of the business? Um, I'm going through this with both of my companies. We have to value them right now based on the growth that we're having, and it's expensive. Um, so you might not be able to pull that trigger as a minority partner. Um, you might have the ability to be watered down, which is my biggest concern. And, and what that would mean is you own 10%. Or 5% and as the startup restaurant or a restaurant group needs to take on more cash, you end up your 10% turns into 2%. Um, and that's been the biggest risk when I see, um, especially independent startups, when there's five, seven, eight investors, it works for about one to three years. And sooner or later, an investor comes back and says, I've had enough of this. I want my money back. And then the minority operating partners are the ones that get hurt as somebody pulls the plug on their cash. And so I think what you're hopefully saying, and you can correct me if I'm wrong on this, is that it's okay to ask those questions. And and so uh, can, do you have any strategies of like um, – because it, it can be sensitive, right? Because the business owner is like, well, like I, this business isn't worth what, what – you know, like I don't have the cash to kind of pay out whatever equity at stake that you happen to have right now. And so it can kind of get sensitive. So do you have any suggestions on like ways to approach that conversation or sit the owners down or the some of the majority equity owners down and have that conversation because i think people think that it has to be this timid like oh i was offered equity i, ju I should just take it right uh, yeah. but uh, you know how do you how do you how do you approach that um i think make sure you get the information that you need 
And I think the key is to be curious. Um, and one thing that I do see, even if the owners, a lot of owners, if they're putting in 5, 10, 15% equity stakes, a lot of it's golden handcuffs, which there's no problem with that. That's how I got involved in my first partnership and it set me on the track that, that I'm in now. But I think it's going to the people that are presenting the opportunity and say there, there's two situations happening now. One is the offer, but one is I'm a young, you know, budding entrepreneur. I just want to learn from what you've gone through. I want to be curious about what's worked for you and what hasn't. And I just want to be clear. I'm looking at in this little home office here that I'm in today, I'm looking at a sign that says from Bidet Brown, clear is kind. Um, it's literally right in front of my eyes. And it's side that said, the more clear we can be will allow me to run forward and support your business as the operating partner and say, I'm really um, here to listen more than I am here to comment. Cause, and again, just going back to my own experience, when I was offered 10%, the first company I got involved in, it was put at a $500,000 valuation. So it means that there's you know $5 million business there possibly or more. And I'm like, the math doesn't make sense to me. And I got very emotional and I handled the situation not as well as I could have because I triggered the person who emotionally thought their business was worth $5 million. So I think as I mature and if I could go back, it would just be, how do I stay curious a little bit longer? How do I feel comfortable? Because it's your future. And the managers listening to this, you're the one, the managers are in shortage right now. The managers are the gold, not leases, not buildings, not equipment, not furniture. There's not even guests. Leaders to run restaurants are what's in short supply right now. So many of the listeners are, and we just went down really high, high, high level kind of business talk. Many of the listen, listeners right now are probably saying, okay, Matt, it's great that these big franchises and these leadership strategy kind of organizations can bring in consultants and host day long workshops for their, for their teams. Some of them might be saying, I don't have resources to do that. I have a little small independent. There's, there's seven people on my team. There's 13 people on staff. I have 19 team members. So if you had to provide, let's say, two to three key takeaways for people, maybe from the book, maybe from specific case studies from your coaching that people can action on this week in their workplace, even if it's small, what do you suggest? So actually, I think there's a couple of things just at the top line. And I agree that, you know, bringing someone like myself and as I go in and coach lots of teams in a live environment might not be feasible. But one thing that COVID did for us is it made content free. So there is more content, like just before COVID, we signed on to do an online course with a company called Lightspeed VT out of Vegas, made a major investment. We're still really excited about it. We're selling two hours of online content for somewhere between $197 and 97 bucks. <coughs> Excuse me, we planned on uh, selling it for a couple thousand dollars. So you can find content for free on YouTube around a topic that you feel is that need to educate your team or to move your, your team forward. The other thing is making a commitment to personal development. You can pick up books. There's, you know, you can get a list of the top 10 books from the people you've interviewed to go through as a team. The key is how do we continue to allow our people to learn and grow? And I think if we were going to, there, there's a bunch of different topics. I think one of the top three things, um, there's lots, it depends on the need of the operator. But I think the key thing is how do we win 2022? So how do we have a clear definition of how we win the year? What's the definition of success? For a lot of operators, that's unclear or it's profit or sales. And people don't buy into profit and sales. They buy into behavior, actions, what I do. So how do we win the year would be one of the first things we need to be able to define with our leadership team. The next thing are what are the three drivers that lead us to our winning goal? Not 12 activities, but the three critical drivers that if we do consistently will lead us to our goal. And then from there, it depends on the need. It could be retention, hiring, path to leadership. Do you find that operators, sales and, and profit margins and number of guests or, or um, average check value are easy to calculate from the sense of that you, you can get these very tangible numbers, you can plot them on a graph. For some of these intangibles, do you have any techniques or, or, or you know tips that people can use to potentially track those kinds of metrics? Because even me now, not, not being in restaurants full time, like, period, I'm trying to struggle with like YouTube subscribers or podcast downloads versus sure. something else that is a little bit more tangible, like helping the most chefs that I can or something like that. Yeah. Um, what, what's, what's valuable for people to keep track of those metrics and make sure that they're heading in the right direction. And I think the key thing is we can go a little bit more tactical terminology would be what's the leading indicator and what's the lagging indicator. Um, and if I like, so that would be, what's the behavior that produces the result. So leading and lagging might be tactical, but if we want profit, 
What's the behavior that when done consistently is going to produce the result that's desired for the business? So on your side, if you want to grow um, the number of podcast downloads, it's how many interactions am I having online? So there's something that's leading to downloads. It's just my background initially is sales and the beer and spirit side of the industry. But what's the behavior that when done consistently, if we act on as managers, servers, backhouse staff, whichever it is consistently, is going to produce average check that's going to produce profit. So we have to look at what's what's that behavior. And there could be, it could be marketing. It could be suggestive selling. It could be tracking certain items in your POS if we want to get granular. It could be managers recognizing their staff for positive behavior. So we got these drinks on the table in our four minute timeline. That's how we get average check. So I, I'm usually looking up front. I think profit is a result, as Simon Sinek says. I'm looking at what's the behavior that produces the result. It's almost uh, James Clear talks about that as well. It's like all your habits are a lagging indicator of whatever you else, uh, whatever you have. Like your 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 weight on the scale is a lagging indicator of your exercise habits. Is kind of like a great or like the it's number of times that you go to the gym. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. So you talk a lot about the importance of leaders having a clear vision and getting people to believe in what you believe. But when you're first starting off as a leader, it can really feel daunting because if you don't have the, if it, you either have the courage to forge your own path and adopt your own techniques and say, this is how I've always wanted to do it. I have the leadership position now. This is kind of what I want to do. Or if you don't, sometimes people fall it, fall victim to quote unquote, doing it the way that their bosses did it, which can lead to this kind of like really demented tame game of telephone. And you have these like multi-generational lines of leadership. That's like, nice. you can tie it back to one person who did it a really poor way. And now the person six generations down is also doing it that way. So yep. what should people keep in mind if they find themselves in a leadership position and they really want to plant their flag on their beliefs? Yeah, I think, and if it's a leadership position, um, say they're starting their own restaurant or taking over a leadership position, a lot of times it is really easy for me to relate back prior to an opening. So I talk, especially when I talk to owners, they're like, this sounds really complicated. It sounds a bit woo-woo. Do I really need this? And it's like, you might not need it, but your, your people do. And you do need it. And I'll, I'll back sell that idea to them afterwards. But what I want to do is I want to take them back to when you, when you took the lease, when you walked into a building that was cement or somebody else's restaurant that you thought you could do better, or you picked a location in a community for a reason because you thought you could serve that community better or the day that you got your keys and turned the door, or the days that you unlocked them and let your first guess it, there was a vivid vision in their mind of what they were looking to create. So sometimes when we're in it for six or 12 months, and now we have all these employees and we're growing and we're doing something different, it's hard to articulate, but I just want to take them back. Because a lot, usually some will change. You might've changed 20 or 40% of your direction, but there still, still should be that foundation of why did you, why did your business need to exist in the first place? Why did you put your house on the line? Why did you switch your jobs? You know, why did you take a risk in an industry where 80% of restaurants go bankrupt in the first five years? And what I'm trying to do, because that, that sparks emotion. So if I can get them thinking about those early stages, we can get a foundation of what our vision or, or intention was. And even some of the biggest groups that I work with that have been in business for 20 years and I'm brought in to, to take them back or recreate a vision. I had somebody call me a couple of weeks ago and say, Matt, that, that session was great. But really all we did was document 70% of what we used to do 10 years ago. And I said, good. You know, we really shouldn't be changing a, a dramatic direction to recreate a vision or our why. It's, it's usually there at the core of from when you started the business and what allowed you to get to this stage, whether it's one year or 10 year or 20 years down the track. And it can often, you know, I see it too with people who fall victim to shiny object syndrome. They're just kind of constantly chasing something different, or it becomes this thing where they just get trapped by, oh, well, I couldn't possibly delegate that. And so then they end up being bogged down by trivial things where they can't focus on having the vision. Um, and more importantly, as, as you kind of pointed out, conveying it to their team. So I guess if someone has done that work to really land on, okay, this is what I believe in. This is what I want to bring into the world. This is how I want my business to run and the culture that I want to create. What is helpful to convey that to the team? Because I think you can have these all hands meetings where a chef gets up and he talks about stuff or the general manager gives this really motivating speech, but it's like people can leave. What is it like? inspired is bad motivation is good where it's like you can feel inspired but it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to do anything about it right so 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 what what's helpful for people to kind of they have their vision now i need to get everybody else to buy in 
Exactly. And I think the point is sometimes we'll get people that get up and do motivational talks or rants and they, even we can all go to a conference and get inspired for a day, but it doesn't mean we're going to do anything different. So the one thing when we're writing these, how we win statements or vision statements, the one thing, or before I get on, got on this podcast today, I spent an hour this morning going, what are some of the things I may talk about? And why would your audience, and excuse my language, but why would your audience give a shit about what I'm going to bring up? That's right. So when I'm sitting in front of an owner or have putting them in front, uh, we just did this with a group uh, two weeks ago with, with 150 franchisees. And I'm, what I spent, and it took me a couple meetings with the leadership team to say, it's not about us. We're trying to create motivation and change in the people sitting in the seats. What do they care about? And what the support office cared about and what their franchisee base cared about based on COVID, they're connected, but they're defined and talked about differently. So how do we frame a conversation? How do, like, so if I'm talking about, I want to produce profit um, for my business because I just blew through $250,000 of my savings through COVID, the side would be, here are the behaviors that if we do are going to allow you, our staff, to get more hours. We can hire another manager. We can make this reinvestment in our restaurant. We can make this change. So it's not about us taking the money out and putting it in our pocket and walking out the door, but why would the staff care? And they want security. They want security for themselves. They want to make sure that we can have the, the capacity of team they need to run the business properly. And I bet you in any restaurant out there, there's probably a couple of things we could invest on and change that they would care about. And if you want to go a layer deeper to say, if you actually follow these, one thing we've done a lot, if you follow these processes, you know, server or backhouse member through our tip pooling or whatever it is, you'll be able to go to Mexico with your significant other or self. You know, let's make it relatable to them. Um, and what might become before we do the speech is we might have a conversation with them about what do they care about? You know, coming out of COVID, I really encourage you to have a conversation with your team around what matters most to them right now. Because what we, what matters most to us, something might have changed. They, they just want to know their hours. They want their schedule a week earlier. They want the pay period to move from two weeks to one week if possible so they can make their bills. Really, all you got to do is ask questions and listen. Do you find that that's best? I, I, I certainly found with, with my team, because I'm a board member of an event production company that I co-founded in 2018. Okay. And those, we call them drivers in our, in our organization. And so um, what's kind of driving you, sometimes it's income, sometimes your wife's pregnant and you want more time with family because that's been a recent shift. Yeah. And I think what we always try to hammer home is that like the drivers could change every six months and yeah. that's okay. And I think that we have success with having one-on-ones with people, but do you have any other tactics of managers who they're like, I've never had a one-on-one -on -one with my team, <laughs> you know, cause like yeah. I've worked in places where that's never a thing, or maybe it's like a yearly thing. Once a year, you get to sit down with your manager and it's this very templated thing. And you, it's almost like an interview again, where it's like, you're dressed up and in clown makeup. And they're also not, not quite how you saw them on the line last night. And they're just like, they're, you're, you're two people having like this completely artificial conversation. Yeah. And so I think that part of the, the problem with that and the reason that that happens is because it happens so irregularly. And so um, I guess what, what you see that's valuable for folks. Um, there's two core things that I would look to implement into any new client. And sometimes it takes some trust and time to earn because it, it is a commitment of manager time and, and bandwidth. But one is a, a regular meeting frequency, a real meeting frequency. So, so many teams are having a weekly meeting that's an everything meeting. It runs over schedule. People are frustrated. It's the same conversation each week. So how do we get our communication and meeting frequency right? And we've got a, we've got a bunch of, um, if you go to the website, there's a bunch of free downloadable resources that talk about meeting frequency. Um, to be honest, they're not mine. We've studied everybody who's written on the topic and tried it and, and put different processes together. But the next step after we have our, our communication and meeting rhythm right is I really encourage people if you're not having frequent one-on-ones with your managers and leaders, we're missing connection and the development opportunity that they crave. Um, and I do see a lot of leaders leaving now because they don't, they're not getting the one-on-ones so they don't feel developed. So they're leaving for somebody who is going to make an investment in them. Um, but there's two, my favorite two great books are one is Radical Candor. Uh, the other one is The Coaching Habit. They're both quick reads. Uh, the Coaching Habit has a seven question one-on-one -on -one process that makes it about the person. It makes it not about you, but about them and where they're at. So it's not a tactical management meeting. It's about talking to your people about where they're at. Um, we can make that available and send it out. It's, it's Michael Bungay Stainer's work. And I think it's the best out there from anything that I've, I've looked at. But I think having, and I, my advice to anybody, if you're looking to take on one-on-ones, is everybody I talk to is like, I'm going to do them weekly. I'm going to do them weekly. 
If you're not doing them all, make sure to be very cautious with your commitment of your timing. You could go from not at all to monthly, then to bi-weekly, then to weekly. Go bi-weekly, then to weekly. I encourage you to try to get to weekly, but if you overcommit and cancel, your beneficial one-on-one to build trust and, and connection and development of your people will actually do the complete opposite. So it's just where are we today and where do we want to get to and how do we progressively get towards the relationship we want and need with our employees for them, but also for us. And maybe back me up on this, or you can feel free to disagree, but when you do it at a more regular cadence, it doesn't have to be a one hour meeting. It can be a 10 minute check-in. You can do six of them in an hour if you have them back to back to back to back. Yeah. And that's the thing where I think people get scared. Like I've got, we had a great client two years ago, pre COVID where each general manager and all of their outlets are spending a day a week on -on one-on-ones. And I said, I gave them a hug. I'm like, this is awesome. We made a commitment of time. What's the outcome of the one-on-ones? And they're like, what do you mean? And I'm like, you, well, you guys are you're great. They're incredible. We're a restaurant group um, across North America. And I'm like, okay, let's just put a definition around it. And we don't need to spend 60 minutes, 90 minutes. Um, sometimes that's just conversation or it's a tactical manager meeting where they're being told what to do. So I think there is a, a safer place somewhere between 10 and 30 minutes with the right amount of frequency. And what we're trying to do is show up, say, we're here to serve you. Like our job as leaders is to be at service of the people and make sure they're, they have the clarity and support to move in the direction of your goals. That's the point of the meeting. If we're talking about, and your definition, your one-on-ones might be different. Um, but if we're trying to have a simple definition, it's how do we move our people in the direction of our goals with the support that they need? And it's for them to, to create questions and it doesn't take an hour if it is done on the right frequency. I'm going to switch gears to talk about consulting because a lot of chefs end up making their way into consulting, whether it's between jobs or they use it as a chapter in their career to expand their network or quite frankly, sometimes they just need to make money and consulting pays more sometimes than being a line cook. Or maybe they want to slow down the lifestyle a bit. They don't want to be working 80 hours a week. They can make just as much money working 40 hours a week as a consultant. So I know that you're more on the kind of like leadership side and and, and business side of of businesses. But when you think about consulting as a practice or as a career, to the chef that might be considering consulting or has been asked to consult, what should they keep in mind? Or you can frame it the other way, seek to avoid as a consultant. I think the one thing that, that I learned, um, you know, we had our first year when we split the companies and I went to f- fully into leadership coaching. What I learned is the model that I had wasn't scalable. So we had an incredible first year and, you know, I'm on planes every week and I'm working with these great clients with really, you know, high investment clients. But if it wasn't a scalable model and once people unplug a hundred thousand or 200 or $300,000 project, there's a hole there in your sales cycle. So you then, as a consultant, you might have a great six months, then you've got a two month sales cycle to get your next project. So the one thing that I've encouraged you to look at is what's the work that you really love and you really want to do. And then how do we package it if possible, where it doesn't necessarily, and this might not be the case because you do it. Some people have to go and consult on a menu, but how is it continuous? And how is it something you, the cost, your cost might go down? You might be charging 2000 a month, 5,000 a month, but it goes, it goes down over time but it has an ongoing life cycle that could be billed monthly that allows you to stay connected to the business. So I think there really is a choice, support somebody ongoing or plug yourself in for 30, 60, 90 days and then unplug. We all know that usually once we plug, you know, um, a hired gun from a hired chef to come in and create a menu and we unplug them, the program fails when we unplug them. So if we, and a lot of owners have been hurt where they've made that investment and then the money's gone away. So what we want to be able to do and make sure to do is we can sell against the need to say, we're actually going to stay with you to make sure the program is sustainable. And my cost goes down as your team becomes more involved. Again, there's, I think that, that I think it's a loose description there. People might be sure. Sure. Confused. But, but it seemed it might. And, and it was for me when I first got my first consulting offer, it seems counterintuitive as a chef to seek out a long-term kind of like retainer almost yeah. style model yeah. with an engagement with a consulting client, because we're taught That's like the dish is done and it's on the table for the guest. It's like, cool. Like that's done and dusted. Like check it off the list or you're, you you think in prep list mode, right? So it's like, okay, cool. The, the deliverables from the contract with this consulting client are done. Therefore there's no more work to be done. And I think you're phrasing it from the sense of like, 
find the additional opportunities or the ways to potentially leverage that relationship into something that could be an attractive retainer for you or where we, you can continue to provide value to that business. Yeah, I think it's how do we make sure that it sticks and, and stays? You know, how do we make sure that the, the concept that we created, because I think if we sat with as consultants, and I used to be, I consider myself a coach now, but used to sell myself as a consultant. And I was taught by one of my first mentors to back self. So to go in and say, what we, what we committed to doing, give me a score on a zero to 10, did we achieve it? And there's the lesson to say, are we getting to the end goal? And I'm not saying there's not a 90 day project out there. That's going to be great for you, but I'm also looking to make sure that are we, cause when we go in the restaurant world and we say consultant and I look owners in the eye, they, they cringe a bit. They say, I've hired a bunch of consultants. It didn't work. That I've hired a bunch of guys like you. It didn't work. I said, or girls like you, it didn't work. I say, I respect that. But let me share why this approach is, is different. So whatever you're selling it, most operators have hired somebody similar in the past. You need to identify what your competitive point of difference that's going to make them feel comfortable with taking that risk again. And a lot you of times, did, go ahead. Yeah, go, yeah. Uh, you talk about, and I'm switching gears to talk about coaching now. You talk about aha moments when you're coaching really high performing leaders in the industry. True. Sure. Do you have any favorite aha moments or ones that kind of stand out in your in your memory of people who? you know, you really seemed to have an impact on and, and how you were able to get that them across that line. I, I had this experience last week. Um, I was out uh, working with a client by the airport here in Toronto. And I was, I previously worked with this group here called Turtle Jacks and they've got approaching 30 locations, you know, great group, really high volume. And when I got brought in to work with them, um, one of their concerns was that they lost their identity. So here in Canada, a lot of the national chain accounts turned out to be dark, Really nice TVs, you know, marble builds. The similar, we'll see this in the U.S. as well. But this common, kind of common theme, where if we took the name off the front, we might not necessarily know where we are. So this place is called Turtle Jacks Muskoka Grill. So when we worked with them, I said, "Well, how did we become, you know, dark black uniform, you know, mainly female staff is what they ended up hiring when they were 50-50 split before?" And so we just got influenced by our competitors. So after working on their vision and what their service strategy was, we came up with the term cottage hospitality. They came up with the term cottage hospitality, and that's what Muskoka Turtle Jacks Grill was all about. Um, and they just there was a definition. And when you go to a cottage, you've got a drink in your hand as soon as you get in the door. You know, you've got somebody greeting you and making you feel comfortable. You've got this kind of home like feel. And I walked to this location at the airport last week, and it wasn't. This is what we planned out. And I saw these designs as they actually sold the business, which was part of the strategy as well. So there's a new owner in place of, of this national chain. But walked in, and it was it was all white design. And it was open concept. And there was somebody, although it was lunch and it's quiet by the airport at lunch, there was still somebody at the host stand to make sure the service experience was was great. So that was one of my biggest pieces is to able to get somebody to really connect with their identity rather than buying into that commitment of their competition. There are a lot of people in the in the industry who are making the change to remove themselves from the industry because of COVID, because of they had to, they couldn't afford to live in New York or San Francisco anymore. So they had to move back home and now they're doing something else. But I find, and I get these questions, whether it's on Instagram or in YouTube comments or someone sends me an email, that they're going the other way. They used to be a software engineer or they used to be an accountant and now they want to enter the industry. Yeah. And I think what's so exciting for me is through people like you and, and um, chefs and operators being more open to taking inspiration of work environment stuff from other industries, we're getting less pirate culture, more professionalism, yeah. ability for growth, all these sorts of good things. And so to the person who has not been in hospitality for ages and is about to enter it, what advice do you have for them? Because it might be a little, it still might have those inklings of this kind of like rough and tumble uh, kind of environment that might be different for them. But do you have any advice for someone who's changing industries and coming into hospitality for the first time? I, I would, again, one thing that we, I mentioned earlier is just that stay curious. So all, the, all industries change, some change for the better. Um, you know, we talk a lot about people losing trust in restaurants because there's been a spotlight on it, but I think there's other industries that have created the same. So I would put myself in position to have conversations about, you know, what, you know, whether it's with another manager, you may be able to reach out to through LinkedIn or social media and just say, can you tell me a little about what it's like or an operator or there's recruiters in every major market that you could say, Hey, here's what I do now. Um, I'm interested in this industry. 
Because the one great thing about the restaurant industry that it needs so desperately right now, and this is what I will spend the next three years of my life fighting for, is we need the leadership in our industry to lead us through this. We need people that are going to come in and bring a slightly different approach and bring common leadership practice or common business practice into restaurants. Because one thing I say is that COVID didn't create the challenges we're facing right now. It just magnified them. They were already, they were already there. Rising costs were there. Staff issues were there. We've magnified and a lot of these numbers have increased. But the great news is if we go back to the financial crisis, if we go back to non-smoking being implemented, coming out of these really challenging times, people win. They'll be in Seattle. There's going to be a budding three, five restaurant location group that's going to be there. That's going to be the hottest in the city 12 months from now. And that group's scrappily meeting somewhere right now, thinking about an idea where they need leaders to help and make a reality. And it's not necessarily what we realize is we don't, necessarily need somebody who started as a host who's now going to know how to serve tables who can now be a GM of 200 people or 40 people. We need leaders to lead people, to create common behaviors, common patterns for our staff, to create common guest experiences that keep people coming back. And it's a fun industry. It's different. And if you're built, you're burnt out on the software space, um, we might think restaurant managers are, are overworked, but hey, there's a lot of other industries that are pushing pretty hard, whether it be financial consultants outside restaurant industry or software that you might get a, a really good experience for, for three years or, or for the rest of your career. You never know. That's right. One more question. Uh, but before I ask it, we haven't really touched on the book yet. So I'm curious if, if, if you can talk about a little bit of, of, of why you wrote the book, what, what you hope people can kind of gain from it, or, or maybe a little bit of uh, behind the scenes and what you learned in, in writing it. Yeah. And I get it like this is where we never really give a hard pitch on the, on the book. But the one thing I've had a chance to work with hundreds of leaders in the industry and hundreds of owners. So owner operators and then senior leaders in the industry. And a few years ago, this is prior to COVID, I went and just started to write out what were patterns that I was seeing. So whether it was a great GM or great chef, if they couldn't start to delegate and train out their experience, they bottlenecked their career path. If it was an owner that was starting it once they got three, five vocations, and once they weren't willing to delegate responsibility and coach and train and support, the actual business couldn't grow. And in many cases, it started to implode. It might not implode right away, but I've got a bunch of case studies of going through years five to 10 when restaurants start to collapse, groups as they scale because we weren't able to train out the opportunity. So the book was my, my want to share patterns of what I saw in the most successful business operators and share the context and experience, the stories were about behind these leaders, whether they were wins or failures, that if shared with more people, whether you're a supervisor just starting out, you're a general manager or an owner of one location or a hundred, that this, some of these ideas will help you go have that aha moment that can be the unlock to take your business to the, to the next level. So the goal, again, and we talked about scalability, I'm not going to be able to work with thousands of people. It was my hope and I never thought I'd write a book. Um, and the timing was weird with COVID. It was a very challenging experience. It's a lot more difficult for those who have choosing to look at it than, than I imagined. Uh, but it was really rewarding and I'm really proud of what we came out with. And I can, I can promise for the amount of people that we've worked with and the feedback that we've got, anybody who chooses to invest the time into reading that book, there will be ideas as a manager or an owner that should you choose to execute will allow you to change your operation. And I love that we, you, sorry, go ahead. yeah, no, go ahead, go ahead. It's just, and the only thing that the book is written in a way where there's context story, but there's tools that'll help. So there's downloadable assets that are actually going to help you put into practice what was discussed in whichever chapter you're interested in. Love making it practical. I have this question that is a meta job interview question. So if you're interviewing someone, whether it's you're in charge of hiring at a restaurant or you're starting to build that opening team, what do you, maybe you can say what question you ask them, but I'm curious more of what do you look for in their answer when someone is potentially coming on as a leader um, in an organization and, and you're having that, you know, 15 minute, 30 minute interview where you're going back and forth with them. What do you look for in how they answer questions that might influence whether or not you go choose to hire them or bring yeah. them on the team? And the, for me, it's, it's less about the, the question. What we look for is consistency and interaction. So when it comes to hiring managers in, in my company or in, in the people that I get a chance to be a part of the process, is we're looking for seven to eight interactions with the potential candidate before the hire. And some wow. of these could be, we, sometimes we set it up where there's 
a coordinator who greets them and is with the group interview before the interview starts. And they're watching how people interact. Then it might be, you know, a senior manager they're going to report to work for them. There might be a 15 minute call with the owner. But what we're looking for is we're recording after each interview. How, how is the person showing up and how are we really seeing them? Um, there's a lot of study that people don't show up as themselves and to really the sixth, seventh, eighth interaction. And some, some people, when we do this, sometimes this process takes a month, but we can do it in a week. It doesn't mean if you have seven interactions, but I trust us. Even though if you absolutely need somebody now, my fear is that restaurants are out there hiring because of an absolute need that's just going to create turnover in the new year and we're going to be back where we are now. So what I want us to do, depending on the questions, and we've got interview questions in the book and processes, but from my side is how do we ensure that we truly see the candidate? And the second part is how do you put yourself in a position so they can truly see you and your culture? Like I say to people in my interview process, 98% of the people on the planet wouldn't want to work with me. What our company is trying to do right now has never been done in the re both companies in the restaurant industry. We're lots of innovation. We're starting to move into digital. We're starting to move in book space and more speaking. It's a, it's a lot of constant change. So this is something you've got to want to develop yourself. But I promise you, you'll, you'll understand entrepreneurship when you leave and you'll understand being in, in a better position. But I want them to really know that before we hire them. And the next thing that I would do over a question is for any senior hire, and that could be management position, we, we personality profile them. And we also supply them our personality profiles. So we say, we can tell you who we are. Here's who we are. Here's who you are. The report say not mine, but we use predictive index. The report says you can use predictive index, uh, disc, Myers-Briggs, but it says what's the positives of us working together and what's the risks. And we have that conversation as the second last interview process to make sure we can, we could get real about it. Very cool. I want to get into rapid fire questions, but you had mentioned that you had done some work before this conversation to kind of frame some intentionality. Is there anything that you had wanted to discuss or, you know, kick the ball around with that we haven't gotten a chance to, to discuss? I think one thing just is the conversation when, and when we were thinking about chefs and back house staff and, and I, I have a lot of, of friends who are chefs or back house staff that, that left the industry through COVID in a very frustrated way. And my phone rings from somebody to say, I wasn't told what was happening. I'm, you know, I'm angry. And I've given this company eight years of my life and, and they provided no clarity. So they're really in that challenging, that challenging time. So I, I just want to make sure that if someone's looking to go to another restaurant or if you're looking to become a consultant, the biggest thing with becoming a consultant is really seeing your, your own value. So if I could encourage anybody here, like when, when I went out and started doing consulting, and this isn't to wave a flag on my side, that we were charging like $250 for a speaking gig. Now we're charging $7,500 to $10,000 for a speaking gig. And it's essentially the, the same talk. I just couldn't see my own value when I started. And it does take time. It doesn't happen overnight. I've got 15 years to, to track that forward. But I encourage you before you set your pricing, before you set your plan, to sit down and talk to others and really get comfortable around can you live? Can you thrive? Can you survive what you get three, four or five clients after what you're trying to do? And how do you see your own value, whether you're going to go be a leader or manager somewhere else? Or how do you see your own value as a consultant? And even everybody I've talked to in the consultant spaces went through, you set your rate based on how you see your value, not how the person that you're looking to work with sees your value. As long as you could have a solid case and provide an ROI. And I know that sounds a bit woo woo and fluffy, but, um, I just really want anybody who's looking to make a change. Um, if you're a manager looking to go be a manager somewhere else, there's less of you than there are positions. So just just try to try to. I've negotiated for some of my some of my manager friends some great some great packages in the last couple months, and they're fair on both sides. And if you're looking to be a consultant, um, just spend that little bit of extra time checking in with yourself to know your value, because I I assume it's more than you think it is. It's potentially a counterpoint. I have this video that I put out probably coming up on three years ago now, where I talk about the difference between a cook and a chef. And my argument, basically the punchline of that video is that I think more professionals should call themselves chefs yeah. because you get to this place where, oh yeah, it's cool to say, oh, I'm just a cook. I'm just a line cook. I'm just a cook. Uh, and you downplay, you downplay, you downplay. And all of that flips when you're looking for your new opportunity. And you kind of have to do this investigative journey back through your experience to say, oh, no, I do know how to do food cost. Oh, I do know how to write menus. Oh, I do know how to do a little bit of graphic design because what this one time I got asked to, to edit the menu document and print it. And I do know how to kind of like do customer service and talk about food. Yeah. 
And I think that this constant downplaying bites you in the butt sometimes. Like, sure, it might prevent you from getting this big ego of, like, being able to walk around with your chest puffed out that, that you're you're a chef. But I, I, I don't see any harm in that. Like, wouldn't you want to work with a bunch of, like, a big, large team of 11 chefs on the team? Like, that's fucking badass. You know, like, you, you guys can conquer the world with a team of 11 chefs yeah. versus, like, oh, well, I'm not the chef, so I can't make that decision. That's the chef's job. And I think that's kind of what you're saying is basically – I, I, I see it as backing up my point that you should kind of value yourself a little bit more than wherever you might be valuing yourself at now. Yeah. And I think it's looking when, when we look at the job posting of what somebody's looking for. So they're going to be looking for chef experience, cooking experience, but they're also looking for really ultimately on any management position, how do you guide other human beings? How do you earn the trust of them? How do you communicate with them? How do you get consistency by leading them? And that, I think, you know, where the value is and some of the other tactical things we can learn. I think it's the want to learn. Like if we have to redo a menu design and we're responsible for design, are you willing to say, hey, I'm willing to learn a design function if that's part of the position here? But ultimately, you know, as leaders, it's in, if you've worked in the back of house at certain points in your career, you have coached and guided other, other people to do great things. And unfortunately, we're trained to say we did 400 covers last night and we messed up seven and we focus on the seven. But it's to look at what's the percentage of great experiences we created in your career. A question to ask yourself, how many people have you have you worked on a team with? How many people have have worked with you? And I don't use the words a lot, but worked for you in the hierarchy of the structure of the restaurant you worked with and sharing that type of experience and, and what your desire is. But we, we really want to lead a restaurant so others do things consistently based on the specs that we've set as a chef. If, and if we can, if we can sell that, like if I'm an owner and I can get a chef to go in and say, I've led, you know, 186 people in my career, we've, and here are the reviews, here's our customer service scores. And I have a desire to learn and develop and execute your vision. It's different than the chefs coming in and saying, why should I work for you? And that's what ultimately allows you to potentially like burst through that ceiling because a lot of chefs might be frustrated that like, cool, I started off making 10, 25 an hour. Then I got promoted to 1875 and then I got management where I was making 34 an hour, but I'm kind of stuck there. Yeah. I don't really know how to kind of like crack through that. And what you're talking about is potentially one of the m multiple ways where you could potentially burst through that ceiling. Yeah. I think it's the, the ability to let go and, and coach others to do the job. If not, we're going to bottleneck in, in doing, and I've seen so many incredible chefs that have to continue to do certain elements of execution or prep or scheduling or costing or design menu design menu innovation um but at a certain point if you're the best at that and not able to replace yourself then you're going to bottleneck yourself and then you get more i see people I, I see great female leaders and male leaders call me and say i've got no opportunity for growth and when we unpack it um i can't tell you how many leaders are at the end of it they've got tears in their rolling down their face because they're like you're right. Like I'm not delegating any of this or willing to, and I, I don't want the pressure anymore. So at a certain point you have to decide, do you want to execute? Do you want to personally execute or do you want to lead? And it took me, I'm saying this lightly. It took me five years in my business to get out of my own way and put a CEO in. I'm not a CEO. I'm an artist. I've got a CEO and I, I put James in place in both my companies and stepped out of the way. And they've had record years since <laughs> growth and customer service and everything. But I, it took me that long, so I say it lightly. I, I needed to get out of my own way and do what I was best at. Um, and in doing so, I was able to continue to grow. And I hope if you look at where you want to be, you can keep, create gravity in that direction, not just gravity towards where you are today. Love that. Let's pivot, do some rapid fire questions, and then we'll, we'll wrap things up. They don't have to be rapid fire answers. You can kind of dive as deep in. So as, you got as me you nervous. Rapid fire. Yeah, know. yeah, yeah, yeah. I know you do, but I have to. <laughs> uh, it's, I, I phrase this as it's kind of your first day of your weekend. You kind of, you know, uh, lumber into the kitchen and you're, you're making eggs, whether it's for you or for some friends over for brunch or for, for some family. How do you make your eggs in the morning? Over easy. <laughs> that was this morning. That was a straight, I don't need to get a chance to do it during the week. It wasn't the weekend, but that is, yeah, that's my, uh, that's my go-to. It's not, um. I could use a lot of coaching from our audience on, on how to eat better in the kitchen. <laughs> on on egg technique? Yeah. Oh, that's so funny. Yeah. This is an interesting question that, I, that I'm that i curious, and sometimes it's a bust. Sometimes it results in some interesting answers. Sure. What's one thing that you've changed your mind on in recent memory? Um, in recent memory, if I want to go a little bit deeper for the audience here, one is mental health and self-care. 
Um, one thing that I share in some talks I get, I had a talk yesterday where it was a mental health talk and, and I didn't realize to the point until about 24 months ago. So a couple years ago about how I suffer from anxiety and depression and how, if I don't take care of myself first, that I'm not going to be able to take care of the people I coach, the people on my team and the people in my home. Um, so my side is just that, that self-care side, whether there's a mental health component or not, is how do we make sure no matter how busy we are, no matter how important work seems to be, how do we make sure to carve out time for self? Because what I, what happened to me is I didn't, and I had incredible business success. I had a good family, but I was absolutely empty in the tank as, as a person. And I burnt out a few years ago. So that's one thing I encourage us all coming out of COVID is to make sure to take time for self. And I mean, if you don't mind getting a little bit tactical, what does that look like for you? Do, do you meditate daily? Do you go on walks? What, what What's helpful? Yeah, there's meditation and, and journaling um, every single morning. Um, there is workout routine that's built in. And then there's just carved out space once a week for myself. So right now we're going into in Toronto and certain areas. And I lived in Calgary last year in the ski season. So in the winter, my time is um, based on my work. If I went on the golf course, I felt guilty. Whether even if a client invites it, I was there going, I shouldn't be here. I should be working with my team. Or if I took a day to go skiing. And when we first started doing social media videos daily a few years ago, I put a video up from Sunshine Village and, and said, hey, this is like, I, I did some work in the morning. I'm here and I'm a better leader because of it. So, um, and meditation and journaling, they might seem like things that are nice to do and we all know about them. If you study any top performing athlete or entrepreneur, it's part of their routine. I, I, I haven't found one yet that hasn't, and I don't think they're lying to me. But I get a chance to meet through the entrepreneurs organization and other groups I'm involved in, some of the top thought leaders on the planet. And as a fundamental, so if success leaves clues, if we just journaled for five minutes every morning, if we, I, I have ADD as well. So meditating, I don't know if I meditated yet, but time to think and block sure. other noise. Um, but all I did was commit to a routine and it fluctuates based on the season. Um, but in my calendar, there's red blocks. I, as I said, I just had a call with my team and we put another red block and I said, that's time for myself. And I'm proving to them that I, do, I need it. And I'm also encouraging them to take it as well. One thing that I'll tack on to that, that, that helps me because I, man, I tried Headspace. I tried Calm. I tried Kevin Rose's app called Oak to, to try meditation. Yeah. And I just couldn't do, I, I couldn't get it. I, I, I was like, this is, this, I, I'm still thinking, I'm just kind of sitting here. I'm just breathing. Then I found Sam Harris's app and that just completely flipped everything for me. Yeah. And the same thing with, with journaling. I kind of liked some elements of the five, the five bullet journal or the five minute journal or whatever it is. Yeah. I tried morning pages for a little while. I was like, this takes too long. This is like three, three day, three pages of just dump your thoughts out. Like I had like three days in a row where I was kind of writing the same thing back to back to back. And I kind of like custom created a journal prompt for myself yeah. where it's like, if I can get through it, it takes less than five minutes. It gets all the kind of like ticks boxes ticked for what I need for a journal to do for me. And it's like, that's a custom. What I'm, what I'm trying to hammer home is just because you've tried it once and you don't like it doesn't mean you have to just throw the baby out with the bathwater and just say, this is not for me. Yeah. Cause there's probably another way to kind of navigate this, to find something that gives you the benefits that Matt here is talking about. Yeah. And we bought every single journal that was out there. Um, we went, we've written some industry based journals that we can give to anybody who's interested for free. And they're based on the industry and best practices from different examples. And, but what matters is how do you find something that, that suits you? And, um, the shift for me was reading the book, wherever you go, there you are. Um, and I never, like, I read a lot, but like read that book. It's sad. I looked at it and I'm like, I don't, I'm not going to pick that up. I don't really need it. And, and just it, being able to be explained to what mindfulness means was a shift for me because we can still think it's just about taking, for me, it's about taking time for self. Um, but that works for me and what works for you or somebody else on your team. It's just having flexibility to, you know, where we got to is how do you take care of self? Because the you emails mentioned... are always going to be there. The work's always going to, you're never going to get through the mountain of work and you're never going to get through the emails or customer complaints or reps that want to meet with you or whoever it is. That's um, right. It really is, you know, they're always going to be there. It's let's, you can take a little bit of time for, for self. You mentioned Radical Candor and The Coaching Habit, I believe, as, as books that you have um, you know, found impactful. But I'm curious if there – it's a question that I, that I ask. Is there a book that's been particularly impactful for your career? And I'm curious, are there other, others that stand out for you? Um, yeah, there's Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. Um, I, got, I, I struggled in, in school. I was diagnosed with a learning disability. I was in learning strategies classes. If anybody remembers, there were six to eight kids in 
as we got to high school, we were all troublemakers and, and just didn't learn. I was told I wouldn't graduate high school. And I found the restaurant industry and at, I think it was 23 or 24, I got handed Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. And it's not about the money. It's about the law of attraction concepts that are in there. And you may believe in law and attraction or not, but I read that book at least once a year. Um, and there's, again, at this stage can go to certain chapters when I need them, but as a foundational book, um, that one always stands out to me. Um, there's different versions and you can say it's a bit dated, but you can find, you can go on YouTube and Google law of attraction. Um, there's a think and grow, which movie out I just saw right now. I haven't had a chance to, to watch it yet. Um, and just trying to think like I, this, if you're a leader trying to define your direction, Simon Sinek, start with why, if you want to read the book or go to the Ted talk, which is the most watched Ted talk out there. Um, and then any of Brene Brown's work, um, I would say, you know, Brene Brown for me has been the most influential thought leader, coach, podcaster, everything she does, you know, professor, um, just the way she writes and her humility and vulnerability and, um, thinking of vulnerability, shame and blame, um, has been such a, a shift for me. So she's got dare to lead and, and she's got so many other great books and a new one that just came out. Um, but if you're looking for a good tactical, actionable book as a leader, the coaching habit is a great quick read. You mentioned that all of these great thought leaders have ways to approach all of these kind of big buckets and macro things that everybody deals with from day to day, strategy, leadership, yeah. vision, design, all these sorts of things. Is there a skill that you're working on or something in what you do that you're still kind of intimidated by? You're like, I still need to develop this, this part. Um, I think, and this is the core of what, what I, I do. Um, and I took this from Eric Thomas. So I had a chance to go do some of Eric Thomas's smaller groups and, and spend a bunch of days with him. But I, I did a bunch of speaking and coaching opportunities and these projects. And I'd go back and see the leaders and be like, you guys were so excited about that idea. How did it go? You must have seen awesome results. Or like, oh man, it's so good to see you. We got really busy when we got back to the restaurant. And we still want to do that, but we didn't. And I stepped back and said, well, that's not good. I felt like I was failing as a coach. So one thing that I am relentless to committing studying, there's actually two things, but one to this topic, one is execution. So yeah. how is in all the work that I do um, for myself, whether it be self-care, whether it be with my own teams, whether it be with the clients, what Eric Thomas, what he was so different from me, he wasn't just talking about ideas. It was all grounded and stop with the talk. Um, Gary Vaynerchuk, same way, stop with the talk and focus on execution. So, and I think that that's a pursuit. It doesn't end because our worlds are, are evolving so much. And the next thing that intimidates me because it doesn't exist in our restaurant industry, but we're launching in 2022 is we're going to build peer groups, community forums of restaurant leaders. So we, we have community, every other industry can join a peer group, show up in a, in a confidential vulnerable setting and share where they're at, whether it's real estate, insurance, sales, retail, and our industry doesn't have anywhere to go and join a group of trusted people to have conversations with our peers that understand what we're going through, um, where it's not therapy, but it's an opportunity to, to share, learn, and grow. Um, I think building connection and tribe in the restaurant industry is we've got a meeting the next Monday. That's my whole pursuit for the next stage of my career is how do we build tribe in the restaurant industry? Because um, I think competition gets in the way and it, and it really doesn't exist. And it scares the crap out of me because I'm worried about people are going to judge it, not accept it. And, and, but we're going to put it out there. We're, we're going. You somehow get a call right after this interview that you've just won an all expenses paid trip to eat at your dream restaurant. And when you get there, there's someone you've always wanted to have dinner with waiting to eat with you. What, what is that restaurant? And who is that person? Um, yeah, I'm trying to think. You put me on the spot too. It's the one thing where <laughs> I haven't been like, I see it like going to, to Nobu in New York with like Robert De Niro and sitting there or for some yep. reason like Denzel Washington comes up and by just the environment where like, you know, it's his restaurant and it's there or, or maybe cause, cause of where it is, maybe Jay-Z comes by as well or something like that. Totally. Yeah. That's who I, my age group showing my 2000 hip hop and then my, my movie selection. But I think it's more just the conversation again, to sit and listen and be curious and figure out how someone like De Niro or, or Jay-Z or Denzel Washington, you know, really built um, this incredible catalog of success in so many, in so many different areas. And that's where you just kind of sit there. Dave Grohl would be another person. Wherever, oh, wherever I can meet Dave Grohl for what a for, legend. Yeah. For, for a beer possibly, or, or dinner. I don't care if it's a hot dog on the street. Um, that would be a, a want as well. Last question. What do you think chefs can be doing better to help the next generation? 
Um, I think that they, they need to, we all need to be focused more on developing the next generation more. Um, so it's not about how do we get through service today? How do we get through the schedule for the next week? Because we're probably short right now. But how do we start to spend time? And you said this best in the one-on-one -on -one side, in the review side. It says, how do we stop once a quarter and do an inventory of our people and decide as leaders? And I know that sounds insensitive, but inventory of our people decide what are we doing as leaders to develop each of them? Because they're all at different ages and stages of their career. So I think if we start looking at our, ourselves and our, our, our opportunity to develop future leaders in our industry, um, we can create more space and success where we are today. Um, but I can promise if you put three, six, 12 months into it, the phone calls you start to get as people grow and develop and especially three, four, five years, they call you and say, thank you. Um, it's worth the effort. And for me, it's the most rewarding thing I've ever had an opportunity to do in my career. Here's a potentially interesting way for listeners to think about it that just came up in my brain because I was thinking back to my experience when I was a, a manager at a restaurant and I had to I was responsible for the numbers and I had to do inventory because you use that term inventory. Yeah. And I remember sitting in a finance meeting and I had hit something like 23% food cost. And let's just say for this example, our, our staffing cost was really high for that month. I can distinctly remember. And I don't remember exactly what the percentage was, but it was getting close to 50%. Like our staffing cost was something like, let's call it for this example, 46%. Sure. So my staffing, my people are costing me twice as much as my inventory is. Yep. And yet I'm willing to spend two hours a month on inventory. Yep. And then shouldn't I spend twice the amount of time inventorying, quote unquote, my people? Just an interesting way for the numbers focused chefs to potentially think about the amount of time that you're committing to something like this in relation to the amount of cost that is getting expended on this resource. And something to share on that, I think the one thing too is where owners need to look at is what, what are they defining as the measurement of success? So reason why, and I get this, this call all the time is my people are just focused on profitability, labor, food costs, beverage costs, whatever it is. I'm saying, cause that's the only way they know how to get a pat on the back or the add a boy or add a girl. So it's really once we set the, how we win in those core drivers, if how we define success is investment in our people, and that is the investment is measured by investment of time. And this is something we work with a lot of clients that have you spent your six hours this week in your one-on-ones and your team meetings, red, yellow, or green. And if it's, it's no judgment, if it's red, it means something happened. If it's yellow, something, if it's green, something happened, but let's look at the pattern because it's what we're defining as success. And too often, I think chefs and back house staff have been left to these metrics, these hard numbers as a definition of their success. So that's what we hold on to. And we're all looking for, you know, Oprah says every time she interviews somebody after, whether it's Beyonce or Tom Cruise, they say, how did I do? You know, afterwards, like the, our chefs are looking for the, how did I do? And if the owner's leaving those metrics as the definition of how we did, that's what they're going to gravitate to. So I think we want to change the goalpost a little bit. And I, I don't, I'm not, and I always get this fight. I'm not telling you to take profit or revenue out. I'm not telling you to take your costs out. But what would be the impact if we put time invested in the development of our people? What's the long-term impact? What's the, what's the long-term uh, increase on the investment? Should we stay consistent with that? Matt Rolf, everybody, where can people go to find you, to download the book, to get, get themselves a copy, or any of the resources that we've kind of talked about it will be linked, but I, I kind of want to, if yeah. people want to ask you a question, where should they go? The best place to go to to find resources and information is mattrolf.com. So it has all the information about the book. It has information about West Shore Online, which is our online platform. It's almost two hours of all of my coaching content um, that somebody can get access to and take themselves or their team through. There's free downloadable assets on the site. Uh, but you can also go to my Matt Rolf profile on LinkedIn, which we'll have a link for here. We put out a, a video a day on LinkedIn of new content, other short videos. When it catches your thread, you'll be able to see it. There's other articles that we feel would be of value to leaders in our industry. Um, so there's usually 15 to 20 posts a week and thousands, thousands of followers on that page. Um, so it's a lot of content that we encourage to get out, but we really do filter it. We're not just throwing stuff out there where it is all strategically planned and, and, and found, but um, our goal is to give as much away as possible. And if you go to either of those platforms, we hope you get some value. And if there's a chance for you to, to, to pick up the book, I'd love to hear your feedback and uh, however else we can help. 
I appreciate everything you do for the industry because I think that there's not enough of us kind of kind of doing it and, and championing all these ideas. But um, yeah, I can't wait to see what see what else you do out there in the world and be a part of that community that you're going to launch because awesome. um, it's it's needed and I'm excited to see it. Awesome. Thank you so much. This was a this was a great conversation. I, I love. It's amazing that that was an hour, but I love the questions and I hope it helped the audience. Yeah, we did it. We did it. All right. Thanks, Matt. Thanks so much. Well, well. Here we are again, together at the end of another episode of the Emulsion Podcast. If this was your first time listening, this is a show for chefs who want to think better, increase their performance, and believe that it's possible to take lessons from what others have learned. I am your host, Justin Kana, and if you're new here, I'd like to personally welcome you to the show. It's really, really great to have you. This is a friendly reminder to check out the show notes inside of the description of this podcast if you want to check out previous guests I've had on the show, links to specifics that may have gotten brought up in this episode, and ways to find other helpful content that I create and share online. If you're still here listening, there's a pretty good chance you're going to enjoy what I put out there because it's all focused on helping chefs and hospitality professionals perform better. If you don't have a lot of time, the best place to start is with the email newsletter that I write every single week. It's called the 8020 Edge, and there I share knowledge on sharpening your skills, asymmetric upside, that's where the 8020 comes from, and exploring the industry beyond the status quo. I say it's a great time saver because I also include all all of the content in that newsletter that I publish every week, everything that I've posted on Instagram, new podcast episodes, and YouTube videos. Speaking of YouTube, you should check out the YouTube channel. There I have gear reviews of knives, spoons, pieces of equipment that I've tested, documented experiences, so going out to eat videos from some of the best restaurants in the world, and other kind of tips and tricks videos of advice that I think would be helpful for you. Lastly, if you want to learn about my intense professional development focused course, get coaching from me to help you make your next move, or support the show financially, you can check out justincona.com support to learn more, and that's greatly appreciated. Last up, and I know that other podcast hosts say it too because it really does help, is to share a review of this show on Apple Podcasts because that helps the podcast universe know that people like us like shows like this. And until the next episode, I really appreciate you spending time with me today. My name is Justin Kana, and I hope you have a good one. This episode of the show is sponsored by a new app called Wisdom. If you like having me and my guest share expertise and stories on the show, you'll probably dig Wisdom. It's an audio-focused app that's bringing top mentors across a ton of different industries straight to your ears. And I'm excited to give it a shot. I'm going to give it a try. I'm going to hop on the platform and see where it goes. So on Wednesday, December 29th, 2021, if you're listening to this, you may have missed it, but I might host things there in the future. I'm going to be hosting a session and I'd love to have some of you folks there. I'll be framing the space where I'm speaking specifically around my 2022 playbook. Those of you who don't know, it ends up being a solo podcast every year. I turn it into an article. I share all the things that I'm thinking about heading into the new year, which is kind of like a year-end review as well. And I'll be writing it at that time. So you'll kind of get a chance to see what I'm thinking about as I'm writing it. And then from there, I'll be inviting some of you folks up to ask some questions. I'll talk one-on-one with you. And for those of you that have been asking to share your stories on the podcast, this is a great chance to do it. So download Wisdom, give me a follow through the link in the description and set your calendars for December 29th at noon Pacific. And I hope to see you folks there.